It is a city built on sand, on fog-swept dunes and dry cliffs of chert, rising from a semi-arid desert perched along a salt sea, a city without water. That there is fresh water in San Francisco, abundant, pristine water, is something of a miracle. Drained from a melting glacier 200 miles away, through a system nobody thought could be built, or should be built. A system some died fighting, and some still want to dismantle. Today, millions of people depend on it, and more every day. But the very climate the water depends on is changing. Our water future is very, very uncertain. The existing infrastructure that feeds San Francisco in the Bay Area was designed for a climate that no longer exists. Crumbling infrastructure and negligence have shaken the nation's faith in what it's long taken for granted. We're going forward into this period of enormous global environmental challenge, not trusting the kinds of institutions that solved the problem before. This is the unlikely story of how one city got its water. And the unsolved mystery of how to keep it flowing. Water from the Wilderness, Hetch Hetchy to San Francisco Bay, is made possible by a grant from the San Francisco Arts Commission. Additional funding provided by the San Francisco Bay Area Planning and Urban Research Association. Long before San Francisco was ever a city, its most precious resource was water. Its first inhabitants, the Ohlone, could only make the peninsula a seasonal stop. And the Spanish, who came after to establish both a presidio and a mission, considered it a remote and difficult outpost. It was a pretty desolate, windswept, sandy place, quite arid. Um, and it, had, it got rainfall, but very little water. When the gold rush hit in early 1848, it was like a, a cataclysmic transformation. It became what was called the instant city after the discovery of gold. As the new city's population swelled from a few hundred to tens of thousands, water became nearly as valuable as the nuggets being extracted from the Sierras. San Francisco is in a very difficult position for a major city to grow because it's constricted. It's surrounded on three sides by salt water. It's also largely built on sand, sand dunes that absorb water. And it's in a Mediterranean climate, which means it's semi-arid. It only gets about 22 inches of rain a year. So because of this combination of circumstances, there was almost no surface water, no creeks. So that meant that if it was to grow, it had to reach outside the city limits to bring in more water, an assured supply of water, and lots of it, if the city was to continue growing. The new city struggled under the weight of such exponential growth and a lack of city services. Some of the houses had wells, but that really wasn't a very good idea because a lot of houses had outdoor privies which contaminated the water. There was an area called Happy Valley near what is now the Palace Hotel where a lot of the 49ers dug trenches in the ground and many of them ended up dying of dysentery from drinking polluted water. The first robust supply of water was brought over by boat from Springs and Sausalito and sold for fairly high prices by the cup or by the, uh, by the gallon. In 1853, San Francisco finally began granting franchises to private interests to build the infrastructure needed to bring a supply of fresh water to the thirsty city. The first genuine water supply began near Mountain Lake and shipped around the uh, northern side of the city in wooden flumes and pumped up to Russian Hill. 
that company that did that was, a, was bought out and acquired by a company called the Spring Valley Water Company, which then expanded their holdings and, and increased the flow of water greatly by tapping into Pilarcitos Creek in San Mateo. And they shipped that by wooden flume to Laguna Honda Reservoir. The earliest water monopoly in San Francisco is called the Spring Valley Water Company, and they built the earliest aqueducts that supplied San Francisco. Its board of directors is a roster of some of the most powerful men and real estate owners in San Francisco. They had a vested interest in making sure that the water kept coming in in ever-increasing volume to ensure the continued rise in their property, both in the city and outside of it in San Mateo County and Santa Clara County. The monopoly was unpopular. Newspaper editorials lamented that San Francisco had the highest water rates of any city in the civilized world. Water was very expensive in the city. It was always a political issue in elections for mayor and for the Board of Supervisors. What could be done about the water rates? When the public was concerned about the high water prices, one of the things that they did was pass laws that said that the municipality could regulate water rates. Well, then the water company had a huge incentive to try and influence those politicians, and that fed the concern about corrupt politics. One Republican leader from the 1880s later said, that his organization received between twelve and fifteen thousand dollars a year from the Spring Valley Water Company in order to keep their hands off the water rates. Graft and corruption throughout city government finally led to a reform movement and the election in 1896 of a young native-born San Franciscan as mayor, James Duval Phelan. In order to create a more responsive city government, Phelan put a rewrite of the city charter before the voters in 1898, giving new powers to the mayor and making the Board of Supervisors more accountable. It also laid the groundwork for all city utilities to be publicly owned. The only viable alternative in Phelan's view was public ownership, that the people themselves directly had to own and operate the natural monopoly and to eliminate the profit motive entirely as a way of keeping such a monopoly from corrupting the city's politics. Phelan saw San Francisco as a great city like Rome, and it was very much, we're gonna build aqueducts, we're gonna build a system that will rival that of Imperial Rome. Phelan began exploring for a source of water for a new city-run water utility. They began to look at the Sierra, of course, because the Sierra is a natural reservoir. It has incredible snow melt. It has some of the purest water anywhere in the United States. Their search led them 200 miles away to the Tuolumne River and a remote valley with an unusual name. For centuries, it had been a summer encampment for the Miwok, who named it for the wild grass that was their primary food source, Hetch Hetchy. It captured Phelan's imagination. Phelan learned about the Hetch Hetchy from an engineer who had seen it. Very few people had ever been into Hetch Hetchy before. The quality of the water coming down the Tuolumne River uh, is really high because it's basically snow melt running off of granite for the largest part. So it doesn't pick up a lot of pollutants on the way. It's one of the most pristine water sources in the world. Hetch Hetchy Valley seemed to them to be just the obvious place for this. It had steep perpendicular walls, 2,500 feet, and a flat floor. So it was almost like a natural reservoir. All you would have to do was put a dam across it. I think that the most important thing about the Tuolumne and Hetch Hetchy was that there was no involvement with a private water company. There were other sources of supply that were available. There, were, there was unclaimed water or undeveloped water rights on other rivers. But most of those, the key dam sites or the water rights themselves, had been filed for by private power companies and private water companies. Phelan, however, didn't trust the Board of Supervisors to follow through, nor did he want to raise the suspicions of the directors of Spring Valley Water. So he took matters into his own hands. Mayor Phelan had his agents 
uh, file for the water rights in the way you did at that time. So in 1901, they took a piece of paper and nailed it onto an oak tree hanging over the Tuolumne River Canyon, saying that San Francisco wanted to divert a certain amount of water uh, for use. And you'd file it at the county seat, and that was your filing. Later on, he sold those water rights to San Francisco for $10. So it was just, you know, moving in an expeditious manner, a uh, very classic case of better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Phelan and his associates kept that location secret because they didn't want other people to try to claim it or speculators to try to get into the act and boost up the price. The sticking point in all of this is that both the Hetch Hetchy and the Yosemite Valley had been included by Congress in 1890 in Yosemite National Park. The gold rush had brought with it a visibility for the natural wonders of the state of California. Paintings by Albert Bierstadt captured the grandeur and romance of the Sierras, including Yosemite and Hetch Hetchy Valleys. By the late 1800s, this appreciation for unspoiled wilderness had sparked a new concept, national parks. With a large swath around Yosemite now designated as protected, San Francisco would need federal permission to build a dam across Hetch Hetchy. When word got out, the opposition was fierce. It was a profanation on the face of it to go into a national park, dam up one of its most beautiful features, and irrigate all of that water for a city's use. This is not the ideal behind how national parks were created. Interior Secretary Hitchcock said, no, this violates the intention of, of, the, of the national of parks. President Teddy Roosevelt himself had seen the grandeur of the valley when he went camping there with a the man who was soon to become its greatest defender, John Muir. On April 5, 1906, Roosevelt's Secretary of the Interior, Ethan Allen Hitchcock, formally declined the city's request for a permit to build a dam at Hetch Hetchy. Less than two weeks later, on April 18th at 5.12 a.m., nature intervened. A catastrophic 7.8 earthquake rocked the city, breaking water mains. Without water to fight the ensuing fires, 500 city blocks burnt to the ground. At nine o'clock Wednesday evening, I walked down through the very heart of the city. I walked through miles and miles of magnificent buildings and towering skyscrapers. Here, there was no fire. All was in perfect order, and yet it was doomed, all of it. There was no water. The dynamite was giving out. And at right angles, two different conflagrations were sweeping down upon it. Jack London. The great earthquake and fire that devastated San Francisco caused the people of the city to realize that they had an inadequate water supply. Because when fires broke out following the earthquake, many of the water lines were broken. And so when firefighters showed up and turned on hydrants, nothing came out. Spring Valley Water Company was blamed for this. The earthquake aroused enormous national sympathy for San Francisco. There was a sense of whatever this stricken city wants as a country, we should try to help them with it. Everyone was already really angry at Spring Valley, even though Spring Valley had to a large degree actually cleaned up its act. They were to blame for it, and by God, it's time to get a brand new municipally owned system of pure water from the Sierra. They actually said that water from the Sierra would be to, compared to the Spring Valley water like a beautiful ripe peach to a rotten one. But the city still needed federal permission to move ahead with Hetch Hetchy. And famed naturalist John Muir had become the voice of the opposition. These temple destroyers, devotees of ravaging commercialism, seem to have a perfect contempt for nature. And instead of lifting their eyes to the god of the mountains, lift them to the almighty dollar. Damn Hetch Hetchy, as well damn the people's cathedrals and churches, for no holier temple has ever been consecrated by the heart of man. John Muir 
This really ignited the modern conservation movement because once you create a national park, it essentially is the equivalent in a secular society such as ours of creating holy land. The nation became very aware that this national park was to be invaded for one city's benefit and became a national controversy. The preservationist argument was based on a romantic vision of landscape and scenery, a way in which Americans could maintain their distinctive culture through contact with the wilderness. This was a time when the environmental movement was awakening. John Muir mobilized some relatively modest numbers of people who really were thinking ahead about protecting wilderness, about protecting some of the wild values that still remained in California. And he spent a lot of his remaining life fighting that project. Once he and his Sierra Club opposed the damming of Hetch Hetchy, all three of the newspapers in San Francisco went after him. Those who opposed building Hetch Hetchy, these so-called nature lovers, were long-haired men and short-haired women, which of course was code for homosexual, in order to cut them off at the knees as people who were unfit, in fact, to speak out against Hetch Hetchy. But the opposing voices were strong enough to block the city's progress for years. And in 1912, the rest of the political stars moved into alignment because that year, James Phelan was elected to the U.S. Senate, Woodrow Wilson was elected president, and John Raker was elected congressman of the newly designed second district. Now, Phelan had been the campaign manager for Wilson in California, and Wilson thought rightly that he owed his election as president to what Phelan had been able to do in California on his behalf. Phelan had some cards to call in from the Wilson administration. One of those, it appears, was the appointment of Franklin Lane as Secretary of the Interior. Franklin Lane was a Californian. He was a longtime political associate of Phelan, and he was now in a position to have a major influence on what would happen with Hetch Hetchy. 1912 also saw the election of progressive mayor James Sonny Jim Rolfe, who quickly took charge of the efforts to gain federal approval. Congressman John Raker from Manteca would introduce the bill to allow San Francisco to build its dam and reservoir at Hetch Hetchy and provide both water and hydroelectric power to the city. Rolfe hired engineer John Freeman to write a detailed report, building the case for bringing the water from the Tuolumne River and damning Hetch Hetchy. The Freeman Report was incredibly long, incredibly detailed, filled with, with engineering jargon. Kind of was a bombshell that overwhelmed the Sierra Club. John Muir, 75 years old and in ailing health, was too ill to travel to Washington to testify against the dam. Congress, under political pressure to assist San Francisco, listened to the engineers rather than the environmentalists. They said, yes, uh, these numbers work. City needs water. We approve it. And uh, President Wilson signed it, and the game was over. And John Muir, who had spent years fighting on this, many people think he died of a broken heart. It seems to serve the pressing public needs of the region better than they could be served in any other way and yet does not impair the usefulness or materially detract from the beauty of the public domain. President Woodrow Wilson. With the way finally cleared for San Franciscans to build a dam at Hetch Hetchy, Mayor Rolfe needed to find a brilliant engineer to mastermind the project. He turned to tough, Irish-educated civil engineer Michael O'Shaughnessy, who'd made his reputation on water projects in Southern California and Hawaii. But O'Shaughnessy had had an earlier bad experience with the city's corrupt politics. My previous contact 29 years ago with the public officials in the city of San Francisco had been discouraging. Other incentives, however, induced me to reconsider my attitude. The reconstruction of public utilities was badly needed, and domestic reasons above all, my wife being a native of the city. 
influenced my decision in favorable consideration of the mayor's proposal. Michael Maurice O'Shaughnessy. Mayor Rolfe closed the deal and gave O'Shaughnessy full authority. Chief, you are in the saddle. You're it. You are in charge. Go to it. It's up to you. You must look on the city as your best girl and treat her well. Do what you think is best for her interests. Where reorganization is necessary, reorganize. We look to you with all confidence. Mayor James Rolfe. Rolfe was genial and he provided the sunny face for O'Shaughnessy to really run the city. He not only built the water system in San Francisco, he created the first municipal railway system in the country in 1912, the Muni. He was a titanic figure of the time. Michael O'Shaughnessy was a force of nature. Arrogant in some ways, but also a man's man. He supervised the whole construction personally. And at the time, it was one of the great civil engineering feats in the United States. Engineers during this time period were often seen as the epitome of what was needed here to take abstract scientific knowledge and apply it to the solutions of public, public life, to apply it to the making of public policy, because that's what engineers did. They solved problems. The remote location of the dam and reservoir made getting to the site a challenge. The first thing O'Shaughnessy had to design was a method to transport labor and materials through the wilderness, as well as provide power for the construction. First of all, they had to get access to the steep slopes of the Sierra Nevada. And so, you know, they had to build a railroad in order to get construction equipment and materials into the site. They had to generate power, and so they built another reservoir to generate power in order to build the system. They mined tunnels using drill and blast methods. They constructed dams using horse and mule and eventually steam-powered equipment. They were able to do a remarkable amount of work with much less sophisticated equipment than what we have today. A dam and powerhouse at Lake Eleanor, above the construction site, provided hydroelectric power for the construction and was the first byproduct of the new system. Hydroelectric power was a major selling point and was very important in the national debate over Hetch Hetchy because there was a lot of concern nationwide that private hydroelectric power companies were monopolizing critical resources. The Hetch Hetchy water and power system really began as a power system. We first began uh, generating electricity in 1918, and it was actually the sale of that electricity and the revenues the city got from that that helped us fund the build out of the rest of the system. Dam construction began in 1919, and workers cleared the trees from the valley floor to prepare it for the future reservoir. The tiny Sierra town of Groveland became a hub for the massive construction project and it was ground zero for the social activities of workers in their off-duty hours. It was like a boom town. It was like a gold rush for this town. It created jobs, and people came from all over the country. These men worked in pretty uh, difficult conditions, and you know, on the weekends or during their off time, they were cutting loose, and they'd come into town, and I guess the old adage was pretty much every building in town was a brothel except for the post office and the church. While on the job, the men were building a structure of historic proportions. Concrete for the dam was processed at a plant just upstream from the construction site, using sand and rock from the valley mixed with cement brought in by the Hetch Hetchy Railroad. Nearly 400,000 cubic yards of concrete were poured around the clock. O'Shaughnessy was this detail-oriented guy. He was having his men dig down to bedrock. They would dig and dig and dig and pull, you know, out debris, and then they'd come and say, okay, we've gotten down, we're down far enough. And he'd go and personally look at it and say, no, dig deeper. 
you know, they created this magnificent dam, uh, which was, you know, using this ancient construction technique of throwing enormous cyclopean boulders, they called them, into the cement mix to bulk it up. In May 1923, the dam was completed and named for its chief engineer. Behind it, an eight-mile stretch of the Hetch Hetchy Valley was flooded, holding back more than 200,000 acre-feet of water from the Tuolumne River in the new reservoir. But it would take another 11 years for O'Shaughnessy to bring that water all the way to San Francisco. He came to the voters in the early 1920s after the initial bond issue uh, had been exhausted and said, give me 10 more million dollars now and in a few years, I'm going to come back and ask you for 23 million more to finish the job. He came to the voters so often asking for bond money that his uh, initials were suggested as standing for more money instead of Michael Maurice. So more money O'Shaughnessy. But he was successful. The construction of mountain tunnel through 19 miles of solid granite brought the water from the dam to Priest Reservoir, and then to the Moccasin Power Plant via four towering pipelines called penstocks. Construction began in 1922, and the four giant turbines began to turn in 1925, generating 20 megawatts and providing San Francisco with hydroelectric power. Bit by bit, the system took shape. From Moccasin, the water flowed through pipelines across the great San Joaquin Valley until it reached Tesla, and then through the Coast Mountain Range, where O'Shaughnessy faced yet another daunting challenge. Maybe the most astonishing feat of the whole thing was actually tunneling through the coast ranges, um, which was, I think that tunnel was something like 28 miles long. It was an arduous undertaking. There was a terrible methane explosion that killed 12 men. But he persevered because he did not want to have to pay on an ongoing basis to pump that water over the coast ranges. He wanted to drill through so that it would be gravity flow from beginning to end. During this same era, the city put bond measures on the ballot no less than five times to purchase the Spring Valley Water Company and their infrastructure in San Mateo, Santa Clara, and Alameda counties, all of which was vital to the operation of O'Shaughnessy's water system. Finally, in 1930, voters approved. And on March 3rd, the city purchased Spring Valley for $40 million. And a combination of old and new would finally provide all the elements to complete the project. The oldest part of the system is the part that's here in the Bay Area that was originally built by Spring Valley Water. In the, in the early 1930s, Hetch Hetchy Reservoir was coming online. And so we have blending that happens here in the Sonol Valley where the Hetch Hetchy waters first meet the local supply and then we bring the water across the bay. In the end, there were 85 miles of tunnels, some of them through solid granite, and another 71 miles of aqueducts to carry the Hetch Hetchy water to the Crystal Springs Reservoir. Hetch Hetchy water didn't finally flow into the faucets of San Francisco homes until 1934, 16 days after O'Shaughnessy died of a heart attack. Though he didn't live to witness the final act of his grand achievement, on October 24th, 1934, O'Shaughnessy delivered on his promise to bring water and to generate power from the Tuolumne River, 167 miles across California by gravity flow to San Francisco. Seven-year-old Neil Fay was there in the crowd. When the water finally did come, everybody was there. And my parents were there. And when the water came down through the Polgus Water Temple, finally the water was there. And then everybody went wild. The Hetch Hetchy system was hailed as an engineering triumph, literally opening the taps for the development of the city and growth of the Bay Area communities downstream from the waterway. And like the gold rush nearly a century before, the region experienced an unprecedented population boom, doubling to nearly four million people. And San Francisco provided Hetch Hetchy water 
to its neighboring cities. The water from the Hetch Hetchy Regional Water System serves about 2.6 million customers in the Bay Area, about 800,000 in San Francisco, and about 1.8 million outside of San Francisco, which are generally cities or water districts. It's been a community effort for many decades now. Hydroelectricity from a growing number of powerhouses along the system economically powered a variety of city services, like Muni, civic buildings, and the airport. Hetch Hetchy is largely looked at as a great source of drinking water, but what generally gets forgotten is that it's equally important for providing a tremendous amount of clean hydroelectric energy. The plentiful water and cheap energy fueled rapid industrial growth. The entire region became home to shipbuilding, aerospace, and ultimately a semiconductor industry that took for granted its fresh water supply. But over decades, the water system that helped create a metropolis was creating an entirely new problem, what to do with the water once it was used. We had this beautiful, pure drinking water flowing into our pipes, and then increasingly uh, throughout the 20th century, but then coming to a noxious peak in the 50s through the 70s, was just the most god-awful pollution of San Francisco Bay. The bay literally stank. San Francisco's engineers may have planned well to secure its water supply from the Sierras, but that vision did not extend to the other half of the equation. The breakfast garbage that you throw into the bay, they drink at lunch in San Jose. So go to the Bay Area was stuck in a 19th century model of dumping wastewater directly into the bay and ocean. It created a massive problem of toxic sewage. San Francisco Bay was a cesspool. That's probably the best word for it. Most cities and municipalities just saw the bay as a, a dumping ground, which was very short-sighted. By the 1960s, the city, once justifiably proud of its water system, was becoming another symbol of neglect in the nation's growing consciousness about pollution. Toxic fires on the Cuyahoga River, the ruinous pollution along New York's Love Canal, and rampant pollution of air and waterways throughout the country galvanized a nationwide environmental movement that would return to influence the region where John Muir first preached his message of environmental protection. The first Earth Day was on April 22nd, 1970. 10 million people in the United States participated. And as a result, the Environmental Protection Agency was established later that year the Clean Air Act, we had the Clean Water Act in 1972, the Endangered Species Act in 1973. So I think the politicians woke up and they realized that people care about clean air, care about clean water, and if they don't do something, they're gonna get voted out. In San Francisco, the new regulations forced the city by court order and consent decree to clean up its act. The Clean Water Act put in place a lot of different regulations that were required. So cities had to treat their wastewater before dumping it. Cities also had to control stormwater runoff. There was an ambitious goal of making sure that the, the nation's waterways were fishable, swimmable, drinkable. The torch of environmental preservation, first lit by John Muir decades earlier, would soon be carried back up to the Sierras. Sportsmen and recreationists now saw themselves as part of a growing movement, and they stepped up their advocacy to protect the state's habitats, including the precious Tuolumne. People pay attention to resources they see that they love, that they recreate on, and we try to make that same connection with the Tuolumne River. It's not some distant uh, source of water, it's our river and we have a responsibility to be good stewards. With this new awareness, some conservationists began setting their sights on reversing what many considered to be California's original sin, the damming of Hetch Hetchy. All around the country, dams are beginning to come down. We're beginning to remove small, dangerous, unimportant dams. But increasingly, we're beginning to remove larger and larger dams to restore fisheries, to restore free-flowing rivers to restore natural valleys. Once again, John Muir's words provided the inspiration to tear down what the city had built. And in 1987, activists graffitied them on the side of the dam to make their point. 
they found an unlikely ally in a Republican administration. Ronald Reagan was in the White House. His Secretary of the Interior was named Don Hodel. And in 1987, Hodel came up with an idea to tear down O'Shaughnessy Dam and restore Hetch Hetchy to its natural state. This idea, coming from a member of the Reagan administration, was seen by many as simply a slap in the face to the liberal city of San Francisco. Because how many conservatives were that seriously concerned about restoring the natural environment? Looking at that story from our current perspective, the question often arises, why would a Republican propose taking down a dam? And the thing that I think is most important about that story is to recognize that environmental preservation was not a partisan issue until the, just the last few years. Then San Francisco Mayor Dianne Feinstein was able to quash Hodel's efforts. But the cause of taking down the dam and restoring the valley has continued to hold power. Even as late as 2012, Opponents collected enough signatures for a ballot proposition. San Francisco voters rejected it by a margin of three to one. It's not something that will ever go away. I'm not saying it will win, but I think as long as people are aware of what was lost in, in this magnificent valley, there will be recurrent attempts to undo it. We live in a different world than we did 100 years ago. Today, Environmental values are critical to us. We understand the value of natural ecosystems. And because of that, the arguments to restore Hetch Hetchy are not only not going to go away, I think they're going to grow in power. My own feeling, as much of an environmentalist as I am, is, um, is that it can't be done because it now not only serves San Francisco, but it serves two and a half million people with cheap, clean energy and excellent quality drinking water. The thing that I think is most problematic about removing that dam may be, again, the power, where if we want to have carbon neutral energy, if we want to respond to global warming, we can't afford to be taking hydroelectric power plants offline. Clean hydroelectric power has been one of the main arguments for keeping Hetch Hetchy. And up until recently, that argument was clouded with controversy. Hetch Hetchy offered the city of San Francisco an opportunity to build a public water supply that would also generate electricity. The Raker Act specified that that power would be distributed by a public grid. The Raker Act that approved the building of Hetch Hetchy uh, mandated that the city not sell its power to PG&E. The whole purpose of this was to have a municipally controlled system. The problem was PG&E had the infrastructure. They had built the infrastructure already. The city had not. That was worth a lot of money, so it required a major bond issue. And repeated attempts, many attempts, to have the city acquire that failed. For decades, San Francisco lived under the threat that the Raker Act might be repealed if it didn't change its controversial arrangement with Pacific Gas and Electric. But in 2016, the city finally came up with an alternative. Clean Power SF, which allowed residents and businesses the choice to buy more of their power directly from the city. So the progressive reformers of the early 20th century, led by Phelan, had this vision of a city in which its public utilities would be owned and operated by the city. As of 2016, the city of San Francisco is now in the business of generating and distributing electricity. And there's an added benefit. The electricity comes from local, renewable sources. That electricity is greenhouse gas free. And so we see a tremendous benefit from that. You know, we really are, are proud of the fact that uh, we put our water to work. But even with most of the benefits envisioned by the city fathers now in place, the supply of water from the Sierras is far from secure. The most immediate threat is unavoidable. Hetch Hetchy's infrastructure is aging. We have a very old system here, and one which, uh, despite the, the great engineering that went into it, starts to show signs of wear and tear and age. And so we recognized we needed to develop what we call the Water System Improvement Program. The fact that we've gotten 100 years out of this incredible system 
it's time to, to, to reinvest and be sure that generations going forward uh, have the same benefits that we've had. The $4.8 billion program begun in 2006 had 87 separate projects, including dams, reservoirs, pump stations, several major tunnels, including the five-mile-long bay tunnel buried 100 feet beneath the bay, all designed to continue the flow of life-sustaining water during a major earthquake. The final improvement project is the replacement of Calaveras Dam in the Sonol Valley. Originally designed by William Mulholland for the Spring Valley Water Company in the early 1900s, it was one of the oldest parts of the system. The old earthen dam, however, had a big problem. If we were to have a major earthquake today, the foundation of Calaveras could liquefy. If the reservoir were at full height at that moment, you could eventually lose the dam. So the purpose of the Calaveras Dam Replacement Project is to build a, an entirely new dam downstream of the existing dam so that we can restore the original capacity of Calaveras Reservoir. When refilled, the reservoir will hold at least 31 billion gallons of water, and it may need to hold more as the city braces for the other long-term challenge to its water security, climate change. San Francisco, like other cities, are trying to think about um, how to deal with uh, problems like climate change and sea level rise and tidal surges. And that's going to be a really big problem because the existing infrastructure that feeds San Francisco in the Bay Area was designed for a climate that no longer exists. The pristine and bountiful snowpack in the Sierras that captured Phelan's imagination during the early 20th century and made it an ideal source of fresh water for the semi-arid city is proving far from permanent. We rely on snowpack, and we're concerned that we may not get as much snow. And if we do get snow, that the rise in temperature, that it'll melt faster, because our snowpack is a form of storage. And so we just don't have enough storage. One of the things that we feel is pretty likely to happen is less snow and more precipitation as rain. That might mean we need to have some additional storage someplace to really make the system work well. Our water future is very, very uncertain. Water experts agree we're going to see violent swings in our weather, so that we're going to have more droughts, and then we're going to have more extremely wet winters. In March 2018, a storm surge from stronger than normal rains threatened the failure of Moccasin Dam, just downstream from Hetch Hetchy. Though overwhelmed by water and debris, the city's water system avoided a major disaster. But the event underscored the danger created by climate swings and whether aging infrastructure will continue to hold under these new stresses. People don't know how we're going to deal and how we're going to adapt. Just like back when we were realizing that pollution was causing our waterways to be so contaminated that it was not sustainable, we need to be preparing for sea level rise. We need to be preparing for climate change and drought. But unlike the can-do era of O'Shaughnessy and Rolfe, today's shifting attitudes towards government find many now questioning whether such major challenges can be met by the public sector. The period of time when Hetch Hetchy was built was a period of enormous confidence in government, where government was seen as the, the bulwark to protect the public from corporate power. We are not in that political climate anymore. We're going forward into this period of enormous global environmental challenge, not to mention water supply challenge, not trusting the kinds of institutions that solved the problem before. We've taken our water for granted for too long in this country, and one of the consequences of that is decaying infrastructure and lack of investment, and communities like Flint, Michigan, that no longer trust their water. Can we trust the government institutions to solve these kinds of problems, given the records of problems that we have? Those are not necessarily events that should be taken as a clear-cut indictment of all government utility projects and infrastructure. We're really going to have to be thinking about the difficult decisions, because it's not necessarily going to come from the state. 
and you're not going to get it from the federal government. So really what we're looking for is leadership at the local level from cities like San Francisco. The city of San Francisco has actually bitten the bullet in terms of the need to invest money to maintain the quality of our water infrastructure. It's explored alternative sources of supply like local groundwater and wastewater treatment and reuse. It's invested in water use efficiency. Uh, those things are helping the city think about the long term. We need money for infrastructure, and somebody is going to have to pay for it. And in an anti-tax climate, finding who that somebody will be is going to be extremely difficult. And that leaves communities like San Francisco in a very difficult place. Just rebuilding and improving infrastructure won't be enough. To make the Bay Area's water supply sustainable, some creative thinking is called for. If we really care about restoring natural ecosystems, if we really care about moving away from destroying valleys in national parks for our water supply, uh, we're going to have to start to look at alternative sources of water. We're going to have to start to look at technologies that let us use water far more efficiently than we do today in our homes, in our commercial establishments, in our industries, in our farms especially. And ultimately, if we're willing to spend the money, we can desalinate seawater and we can get off our mountain, natural mountain systems and provide unlimited amounts of incredibly high quality water uh, from the oceans. But that's gonna require a commitment of policy and politics and it's gonna require a commitment of money. I honestly hope that desalinization doesn't play any role in our future because we have 500 million gallons a day of wastewater just being dumped out into San Francisco Bay and the ocean from the Bay Area alone. And that water could be recycled and should be recycled for reuse throughout the Bay Area. Recycling the water that, that you're already really bringing down from the mountains makes a lot of sense because the water's already in the city. So you build an infrastructure that will allow you to recycle that and you don't need to compete with the irrigators for new water supplies. You don't need to use the energy that is required for desalination. That's one of the alternatives to trying to build our way out of this problem. The whole idea that stormwater, wastewater, and even toilet sewage can be recycled may seem unpleasant, but that's the task San Francisco's Public Utilities Commission is poised to address. We're finding that there are resources that are flowing through our pipes that in, in the form of water, carbon, biogas, that we can not only uh, take advantage of ourselves, but upcycle into products that we can then pay for infrastructure upgrades. A multi-billion dollar sewer system improvement project will rebuild major pieces of the city's treatment plants and sewer systems to begin the process of turning waste into eco-friendly resources. We know that the resource recovery efforts is real, that we know that it has value, and that value usually translates into money. So we know that's a cost saving for our ratepayers and doing the right thing. San Francisco, like other cities, is also looking at what's called green infrastructure. Small scale ways of capturing stormwater, replenishing aquifers, mitigating storm surges, and adding gardens to the urban landscape. As we really realize the importance and scarcity of water, uh, green infrastructure is gonna become more and more important, mimicking our natural environment, doing wetlands restoration, doing green roofs so that we can absorb stormwater and reuse it. Rain gardens, bioswales, it's a whole new vocabulary. But no matter how innovative the city or state might be in its water technology, the toughest challenge may still be at the human level, a shift in consciousness among ordinary citizens about water. When people talk about infrastructure, they talk about roadways. They don't talk about water system because it's out of sight, out of mind. We want to shift that paradigm and have people appreciate water and wastewater infrastructure. And if, like with you, we do drip irrigation, then we're really saving a lot of water. That has a huge impact. A project by the Tuolumne River Trust 
is teaching fourth and fifth graders in Palo Alto that their drinking water is precious. A lot of kids, they have no idea where their water comes from. It comes from the faucet. What we want them to know is more than half of their bodies is Tuolumne River water. While demonstrating what happens to the ecology of rivers when overtapped, they're also teaching these young people about the importance of conservation. The rainwater that comes down your gutter goes into a big barrel so you can save it. We tell them that it was kids who really launched the recycling movement by educating their parents, and so it's their responsibility to educate their parents about water. We hope to plant these little seeds while they're young to help them think about their future, because they are the, the leaders of the future. That's a lesson San Francisco homeowner Lisa Fisher is putting into practice with her son Arlo by installing a home gray water recycling system. We are capturing all the water from our shower, and which also has a bathtub, and from our laundry. So anytime someone showers or bathes or does a load of laundry, just kind of triggers an automatic cycle in the filter and the water goes through a series of screens and then it gets automatically pumped out into the yard. So everything that you see in the yard that's green is watered by non-potable water with the exception of the two raised um, vegetable beds. Along with conservation and saving Hetch Hetchy water, there are other family benefits. I think it's really important to connect kids to the food they eat. It's kind of this ever-evolving project that we're able to, to work on together. A century ago, the people of San Francisco envisioned a new metropolis and built engineering marvels to water its growth. Today, to ensure the taps will flow for future generations, it will take just as much ingenuity, but a different kind of vision. One that reflects a fundamental change in how people think about the water they've so long taken for granted. I think we all recognize that there's gonna be change in the future. So we're going to have to have the flexibility and the creativity to deal with that future as it's presented to us. It's a matter of harnessing it and saying, OK, let's, let's make wise use of everything we have. Weighing the future needs of a growing metropolis against the environmental needs is going to become increasingly difficult as the water resources become more and more and more scarce. Community-mindedness is going to be increasingly important so that people start acting on and voting for things that benefit the entire community and don't just protect their little piece of it. We all tend to forget about water. It's like you turn on your tap, it's there. But it's vitally important to know where that comes from. Not only for our survival as a species to like assure that we have a great supply of water, but to do so in the most responsible possible way. It has to be shepherded and used really wisely.
Water from the Wilderness, Hetch Hetchy to San Francisco Bay, is made possible by a grant from the San Francisco Arts Commission. Additional funding provided by the San Francisco Bay Area Planning and Urban Research Association.